Good morning from my side. I'm Dani Matia, and we're busy with Ignite. The first week we see, see God wants to ignite us to live in a passionate, intimate relationship with Him. The second week, last week, we uh, learned that God created us to be His church, His body here on earth. Therefore, He gave us His spirit to live inside of us. So today it is all about fueling the passion, the passion of this relationship that God has with us and we have with God. And if you don't have a relationship with God, just hang in there, just listen, and I'm sure the Lord will speak to your, your heart this morning, and, I, and that's what, what I pray for. So let's just close our eyes and pray for a second. Father God, we just want to lift up your name, and we want to glorify you, and we want to, to tell you that you are welcome in this place, and that, that we are here together for the, your name's sake. And we ask you that, that you will speak a word to each and every one of us. You know us. You know our hearts. You know our thoughts. And therefore, I ask you just to meet us where we are and to talk to us in a language and in a way that we can understand. We pray this in your precious name. Amen. Gary Chapman, he wrote a book, The Five Love Languages. Wie van jullie het al die boek gelees? Of van het gehoor. Okay, there's a few of you guys. Okay, it's a very nice book to read if you're uh, in a relationship or if you're married. Um, he says there's basically five ways that people express their love for their loved ones. And every one of us has at least one or maybe two, three ways that we prefer receiving love. And if you can speak your loved one's love language, then your loved one will know that you love him. That's a lot of loves in that sentence. Okay, so what he says, the one is uh, physical touch. Some people like to be touched, others not so much, but, but some experience love when you touch them. Then there's one giving, giving presents, nice things. Um, the other one is serving, making a cup of tea or Milo or something for your loved one. That's another way. Uh, then uh, if you can help me, well, what's the others? Words of affirmation, yes, saying Good, nice things to your loved one. What's the last one? Can you remember that one? Quality time. That's all about. That's what it's all about. Okay, so my love language is first of all touch. Um, there's a few other people whose, whose love language is touch as well. And my secondary love language is words of affirmation. So I pray to the Lord and I really say to the Lord, I would love to have a wife that understands and talks my love language. And, and so the Lord spoke to somebody called Hazel, and Hazel listened to the Lord, and she obeyed the Lord, and, and she in, introduced me to Vanessa. And, and to make a long story short, we're married, and Vanessa speaks my love language. She knows how to touch me so that I know that I'm loved. She knows how to say the nicest things. It's so wonderful to have a wife that says the nice things like you, Vanessa. Okay, that, 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 that's the five love, love language. But long ago, I've got two daughters. I realized that there might be more than five love languages. I, I'm, I'm always thinking when I hear five, then I think, okay, why not six or seven? Why not eight or ten? And um, then one time it struck me. There might be more love languages. You see, my eldest daughter, Carlene, she was at that stage in grade ten. There's no standard ah. She was in grade ten, and um, I introduced her actually to a boyfriend of the time. Now they're married, called Kurt. Kurt is a boyfriend, was a boyfriend, now a husband. But the first time, he was in grade twelve. He was in matric. She was in grade ten. And the first time he took her out, I said to her, listen, let's, let's talk about your curfew. I think you must be back at 10. She said, no, I think 11. I said, no, you're in grade 8. You're going out with him a trick. He's got his driver's license and his car, but um, 10 o'clock, that's your curfew. And she's okay, 10 o'clock is fine. So 10 o'clock arrives, but no quit and Carlene. So I was waiting, 10 past 10, quarter past 10, 20 past 10, half past 10, no quit and Carlene, and then 25 to 11, here comes the little choriki, and parking in the driveway. And I was just waiting for them because I can't go to sleep if my daughters aren't safe at home. So I was waiting, waiting, waiting for them, and then she said goodbye to quit, and she came in, and she said, hello, papa, and I said, hello, we need to talk. 
And she said, Hukum, what, uh, actually, what time were you supposed to be here back? She said, At 10 o'clock, but. I said, no buts. Was it gesagt 10 uur? We said 10 o'clock, but you didn't listen. So, um, for the next two weeks, you're not allowed to go out with quit, and unfortunately, next time it's 9 o'clock. But if you show me that 9 o'clock is fine and you can obey that, then it's okay. Then we can think about maybe half past 9 and 10 o'clock again later on. And if you continue to show me that I can trust you, then we can talk even later. And that was the last time Carlene was ever late coming from a date. Talana was never late. She learned from her older sister. So I, I learned that for my children, they can tell me, Daddy, I love you. And it's wonderful to hear that. And it's wonderful to get hugs from my daughters. But if they don't obey me, mm, it sort of messes it up a bit for me. If they want to show me that they really love me, that they really care for me, they should listen and obey. So I think there's another one I want to add, a fifth one. Maybe not for your spouse, maybe not for your verloofde, but for your children. Obedience, that's the one. So I was thinking, if we want to show God that we love Him, I mean, He's done so many things for us. We hear it Sunday after Sunday, we read it in the Bible. Jesus came down from earth, from heaven, uh, from heaven to earth, and, and He lived here as a man, and he, and he teached us, and He showed us how to live, and He performed miracles, and then He died on a cross, and He was crucified, and, and He died, and, and, and He rose again, and He did it all for us. Then, I mean, such love needs to... But how do we show God we love Him? If we really want to show God we love Him, we should do it in a way that God wants us to show Him. I mean, if we speak God's love language, won't that be great? So the question today is, what is God's love language? Have you ever thought of that? What is the way that God would love you to show your love, your affection for Him? Is it that you must pray more? It's very important to pray more, and you should do it. Is it that you should use more words when you pray, more bigger, fancier words? No, you you can just leave that out. That doesn't impress God at all. Is it that you must spend more time in studying your Bible? Yes, do that by all means. Is it that you must experience God's love more when you sing and praise and worship, that you must jump up and put your hands in the air? Do it. If you feel like doing it, do it. Is it that you must do more good deeds? You see, we tend to think if we want to show God that we love Him more, we should know more about God. We tend to think if we want to show God we care about Him, we should learn more about Him. So we put in a lot of knowledge in our heads, but that's not God's love language. If we go to the Bible, it might surprise you what God says. In John 14, Jesus is speaking, and he says in verse 15, he says, If you love me, you will obey what I command. Very straight, simple. If we go a few uh, verses down the line to verse 21, we read there, He who has my commands, it's still Jesus speaking, and keeps them, it is he who loves me. He who has my commands and keeps them, it is he who loves me. And then in 1 John 5 verse 3, Jesus said, in fact, this is love for God. John is is speaking here. He says, this is love for God to keep His commands, and His commands are not burdensome. But but we we, we need to to understand here. God says, to love me is to obey me, to obey my commands. So God's love language is, in fact, obedience. Have you ever thought of that? I hope the light has gone on for you if you didn't know that. But God wants you to show His love for you, your love for Him by being obedient to Him. And that word commands is maybe a bit strange because we immediately think of the Ten Commandments, the moral law, the, all the rules, and the mutsini munis. 
But that's not the commands God was talking about. If you go and look what that word means, the commands be, uh, means the words that Jesus spoken to us. If we listen to His words and we obey what He says, then we are loving Him back the way He wants to be loved. So that is what we should do. We should be obedient. And that is what I thought I was doing all my life. Because I grew up in a Christian home at a very young age, at the age of, well, it doesn't mean it's not feed. I think about 12, yes. Um, I gave my life to the Lord. And um, since then, I always tried to serve Him. I always tried to do the right thing. I was trying to spread the gospel. I was preaching. I was praying. I was reading my Bible. And I, was, I always thought I was obedient to God. But then... I came across the teachings of Torben Sondergaard. He's from Denmark. I've told you uh, in the previous uh, series, about, uh, in the previous weeks about him. And he was giving a teaching on obedience. And he said, sometimes he used the, the, the he said, uh, he used the, the, the example, excuse me, I must first in Afrikaans that I've heard and then I must first in English tell. He uses the example, he says he's got two daughters. Now I've got two daughters, so I can relate with that. He says, if he tells his daughters, go clean your room, your room is untidy, you need to clean your room. And after a few hours, you ask your daughters, um, <clears throat> so is your room cleaned? And they said, no dad, but. You said, why is it not clean? No, no, no dad, but. I've read a book about how to clean rooms. I said, okay, that's nice and that's very wonderful that you've read a book about cleaning rooms, but you should actually clean your room. That is what I ask you to do. And then they go away and after a while I see them again and I said to them, have you cleaned your room? And they said to me, uh, Dad, you know what? I actually went to the Greek dictionary and I found the word for what the word, what cleaning your room means in Greek. And I can say that. And I said, yes, that's all good and well, but that doesn't help me to get your room clean. So you must actually clean your room. That's what I told you, and you should obey what I tell you. Because if you don't, you're not actually showing me that you love me. And then they come back uh, maybe the next day, and I said, is your room clean? And they said, no, no, no. But we're busy writ writing an um, essay on how to clean our rooms. A way to start. What's, what's the best way of doing it? And I would say, no, no, no. You've been disobedient. I didn't tell you to study how to clean your room. I didn't tell you to speak about it. I told you to just clean it. And if you didn't clean it, you haven't been obedient to me. And it struck me. Donnie, you've been doing a lot of things. And you've been obedient in many ways, but not in every way. Because if I tell Talana to clean a room, I know she always goes first to her bookshelf. Because books are important to her, so her books will be very nice and tidy. But if you look at her closet or in a bed, it's clothes lying and flying all over the place because when she gets dressed, she takes out everything out of the closet. I'm not sure. I don't think there's anybody here like that. But anyway, maybe you know one or two. If I tell Carlene, clean your room, then she will, of course, start with the closet because her clothes is so important and she will have that neatly and nicely done. But a bookshelf and a desk will be a mess like mine. Just a confession. But, you see, they've cleaned half of their room or part of their room and, and that is what the Lord was telling me. He, he said to me when I listened to Torben's teaching, he said to me, Dani, you are obeying me in many things, but not in all. You are not trusting me in what I really told you to do, what I really tell you to do. So start doing it. Torben uses the, the, the word from James. James was the brother of Jesus, and if James says so, then you should believe it, because, I mean, as your broer that say, then say, you are the son of God, then you must know. Then you can't know it, you are the son of God. But in any case, I, I'm, I'm getting lost here. James says, if you read the word, if you listen to the word, and you go away and you don't do it, then you're like a man standing in front of a mirror or a woman. I'm just saying. So you look at the mirror, you look at yourself in the mirror, you see exactly what you look like. And then you turn away and you go away and you immediately forget what you look like. 
That is how somebody who just listens and uh, don't do is in the eyes of the Lord. They just completely forget what the Lord is telling them. You see, and the thing I was struggling with was praying for people to get healed. I prayed for myself. When I was alone in my room and I got a pain anywhere or I wasn't feeling well, I had to pray for myself. I couldn't go to the doctor, so I was praying for myself and the Lord wor it works. The Lord healed me on many occasions. But I didn't go out and pray for other sick people. I thought, oh, I must understand it better. I must, I must have no more knowledge about it. What to say, what not to say, how to do it, how not to do it. And the Lord said, just do it. Just be obedient. You see, I was a bit afraid. I had some fear in my heart. And fear doesn't come from the Lord. It comes from the evil one. So I had to get rid of that fear. My fear was, what will people think? What will people say if I ask them, can I pray for you when they're ill? Okay, if they're in a hospital, they always, yes, please pray for me. But what would they say if I just asked them, can I pray for your shoulder? Can I pray for your leg or, or whatever? And the other fear that I had was, what if I pray and nothing happens? What if the Lord doesn't use me? Hmm. Then they will think I'm a fake. That is what the Satan was telling me. But the Lord was telling me no. The Lord was telling me different. The Lord was telling me just be obedient. Just go do it. So um, uh, for early in the year when my mother turned 80, I went to the Cape Town to, to be with her. And, and, and I, I got to my brother's house where my mum is also staying. And when I walked in, in the kitchen, there was my brother's little daughter. She's now in grade five, I think, um, thereabouts. But she's a very good netball player because my brother and my, and my sister-in-law, they're very tall people, so, so they're long and the children are long, so they're very good netball players. Not the boy, the boy's the athlete. But anyway, she's a very good netball player. And the next day, the Saturday, she had to play a very important netball game. But when I saw her, she was on a crutch. And her leg was in a, what do you mean, a cast? So, so, so. I know what it is in Afrikaans, it's a plastic thing that you can Yeah. A moon boot, yes. And she was going, not, not completely a moon boot, but she was going like this. And I said, Sunay, what's, what's wrong? She said, my, my ankle, well, uh, I had my ankle for swook. And it's, it, it's swollen and it's, it hurts bad. And I said to her, because the Lord was speaking to me, I said to her, <clears throat> can I pray for you? And she said, uh, Yo, um, Donnie, come off my bed. And I just bent down, I put my hand on a, on a sore ankle, and I said, in the name of Jesus, ankle be healed. And I said, how does your ankle feel? And she said, uh, it's better. I said to her, is it painful still? And she said, no, it's not. I said, wonderful. Jesus just healed your ankle. Isn't that great? And she said, yes, yes, that's wonderful. And I walked out and, and, and I went to my mother's room and I, we, I was talking. And half an hour later, I, I walked into her and her sister's room and they were sitting on the bed. And when I saw her, I was sort of, what's wrong now? Because she was sitting the crutch still next to the bed and she had an ice pack on her ankle this time. And I said to her, Sane, I thought we prayed for your ankle and the Lord healed your ankle. What's wrong? She says, it's still a bit stiff. I, I can't play netball tomorrow. I said, well, if it's not right, then we must pray again and we must pray some more. So I put my hand on it again and, and I didn't use any big words. I always thought I must use big and nice words and I, pray, I must pray long and long and long uh, prayers before the Lord will heal and the Lord will answer. But I didn't. I just put my hand on and I said, Ankle be healed in Jesus' name. Amen. And she said, the pain is gone. I said, but stand up. We must see if you can run and you can jump without a problem. And she stood up and she turned her ankle and she was walking up and down and up and down. And I said, run. And I said, jump. And she jumped. And she said, my ankle is healed. And this time she believed it. And it was healed. And the next day she played a wonderful game of netball. Because I was obedient. For the first time I prayed for somebody to get healed and the Lord used me not because I prayed, but because the power of the Lord is, is wonderful. And He wants to use us if we're obedient. And, and, and then I, uh, 
One, one Sunday here afterwards, uh, one of a woman came to me and she said, uh, I've got such a sore shoulder. And I said, just let me pray for your shoulder. And I put my hand on her shoulder and I said, be healed in Jesus' name. And she said, oh, this is wonderful. This is wonderful. I can lift up my shoulder. And then I went on and I was picking up the lights here in the front a little bit later. And she came to me and she put, pat me on, on, on my back and she said, Donnie, actually my knee is very sore. And the Lord healed her. And in our life group, um, so, Sari said to me, Donnie, please teach me how we do, should do this. And I said, let's come. And, and, and Susan was sitting there. And, I, and Susan is, uh, had, a, had a sore back. And, and Sari put her hand on, the, on Susan's back. And she prayed for Susan. And the Lord was, was doing miracles there. And the Lord is still doing miracles. Because we are obedient suddenly. We're not afraid to be obedient. Because we know we serve a powerful and mighty Lord and a mighty God. But you see, maybe you're sitting here and you think, I, 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 I'm not just sure. There's something in my life that I'm, I'm not obedient uh, with, um, but, but I, I, I can't do it. I, I, and it might be something completely different than healing the sick. But the Lord sp speaks to one in your spirit, through His spirit that lives in you. Remember last week we said, you are the church, you are the body of Christ because you've got the Spirit of the Lord that rose Jesus from the dead is living inside of you. So when the Spirit tells you to, prompts you to do something, do it. And if you don't, you're obedient, disobedient. But we think we must know more, we must understand better. There's this little story uh, that, that's so true. Um, this missionary, he was on his way to a far off land to preach the gospel there, but on his way, the boat that they were traveling in had to stop at the little island um, to get some provisions. And they stopped at the little island, and he got off, and he met some people there on the beach, and they were fishermen by trade. And he asked them, um, listen, do you know the Lord Jesus Christ? And they said, yes, matter of fact, two years ago, somebody came to our island, and he told us all about Jesus. Uh, but we don't have a Bible or anything. He said, do you know the, fa the, the, the Father's uh, prayer? And they said, what is that? We've never heard about it. And he said, well, let me teach you. And they all sat down there on the beach, and he was telling them, our Father, and they were saying, our Father, which are in heaven, which are in heaven. Kennedy, also Father, and Engels, and, and and Afrikaans. But he teach them the Our Father prayer. And then he got back on his boat, and he went off to the far, far land. And a few months later, he came back on his way home. This time, he wasn't going to stop at the little island. But it was late in the afternoon, early evening, the sun was going down, and he saw in this, he saw people, those fishermen that he taught the, the um, prayer to, he saw them coming, and they were walking on water, they weren't rowing in a boat, they were walking like Jesus on water. And he thought, wow, that's amazing what they are doing. And he said, hi, how are you? They said, hi, we forgot the prayer. What comes after our Father who is in heaven? We forgot the rest of the prayer. But we trust God enough to walk on water. You see, you don't have to have the knowledge. You don't have to know everything to be obedient. We think we should know everything before we can do anything. But it's not true. It's a lie. We should just do something. We should just be obedient when the Lord prompts us through His Spirit. Whether it is to help somebody, whether it is to give something to somebody, whether it is to heal somebody, whether it is to, to preach the gospel, we must be obedient because if we are obedient, then God will use us in a mighty way. And His Spirit will work through us. And then we will learn and then He will teach us more and more and more. You see, you don't learn to swim by reading in a book, by studying how to swim. You, you learn how to swim by getting in the water and to swim. Just get in the water. That is what the Lord is telling me to tell to you. Just get in the water. There was this guy, his name was Michael. He was on his way back home after a Bible study on a Wednesday night from church. And he was driving through a part uh, that he doesn't really know very well. But the, the Bible study, the pastor, the Bible study spoke about hearing God's voice and obeying God. And he was, he was struggling with it. And he was talking to the Lord uh, while he was driving all alone in his car. And he was, telling, he was saying to the Lord, 
Lord, please, if you are real and if you really can talk to people like, like the pastor said, please talk to me so I would hear your voice, so I would know it's you that's speaking to me. And suddenly, he get the thought, buy a gallon of milk. Now, a gallon is nogal baya. So, a container full milk. But he was driving past the 7-Eleven. And he thought, is that you, Lord? But he wasn't sure because he, ne he never f before experienced that the Lord was speaking to him. So he said to the Lord, Lord, that thought about the milk, the gallon of milk, is that from you? Please, please tell me in a way that I would know. And the thought didn't go away. He was just thinking the, f the gallon of milk, the gallon of milk. And he stopped. And he went to the 7-Eleven and he bought this can of milk. And he sat with a can of milk in his car, put it on the seat next to him, and he drove further down the road on his way home. And he was thinking, that was very strange. I, I must have misunderstood the Lord here. And then he saw a street coming up. And it was as if he, somebody was telling him, turn down 4th Avenue. It was 4th Avenue coming by, but, 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 but it wasn't on his way to home, so he had to carry straight on if he wanted to go home. So he carried straight on, but when he passed that 4th Avenue, it was like, no, don't do it. Turn around, go back, go down 4th Avenue. And he stopped his car and he said to the Lord, Lord, please, I, I must know it's you. Must I go down 4th Avenue? And he felt he had the prompting to go down 4th Avenue. The Lord didn't speak audibly to him, but, but he just felt it in his heart. And then he turned around and he went down 4th Avenue and he was, don't know where he was going. He was in a part of town that, that he never drove in before. And he was driving there and he got to another street and it is as if he felt, I must go down there. And he turned his car in there. Then he stopped in front of a house. And he said to the Lord, Lord, I feel like a complete fool here. I bought a five gallons of milk. I can't drink all this milk in, in an hour long. And, and I'm standing here in a part of town that I don't know. What am I supposed to do? And he turned his head and he saw a house across the street. And he got <laughs> the prompting to go to that house and give the milk to the people inside the house. But the house was quiet. It was after 10 at night. It was dark. There wasn't even a light on. And he said to the Lord, he was praying out loud now. He was saying, Lord, but I can't go in there. The people are sleeping. Or maybe there isn't even people there. But he still had the prompting to go. And he took the gallon of milk and he stood in front of the gate. And he said, Lord, now I'm making a complete fool of myself. Maybe the people will be angry with me if I go give them milk. They will think I'm a fool. But I'm willing to be a fool for you. And he walked and he knocked on the door. And it was quiet. And he knocked again. Knock, knock, knock. And he thought, okay, let me make back f to the, the car. And he was just about to turn around and run for the car with the milk still in his arms. And the door opened. And the gentleman, a Spanish gentleman, spoke to him and said, uh, in Spanish, can I help you? And he didn't understand where, very well. He said, uh, the Lord said I must give you this milk. And he just handed the guy the milk. And the guy stood there with a the ga gallon of milk. And... Uh, he said, okay, bye. And the guy said, just wait. And he turned around and he called his wife and at the back. And when he called his wife, Michael suddenly realized there was a little baby crying at the back of the house. And then came the wife with the little baby in his arms. And the husband said to the wife, this man just brought us the milk. And she started to cry. And he said, are you okay? Why are you crying? And she said, we don't have any money. We had nothing left. And the baby is hungry. He's without food for this whole day. And he's crying for food. And we were just praying to Lord, the Lord that he will send us an angel with milk. And she looked at, the, at Michael and she said, are you the angel? Are you an angel? You see... You can be the angel. I can be the angel if only I'm willing to obey. And that is all God asks of me. To listen to His voice and to obey. Not to be fearful of what others will think. But just to obey. Just imagine what can happen if we obey. The Lord can use us 
to touch the world, to make a difference, to show people that He's alive and that He's real. So I want to encourage you, when you go out here today, if you walk past somebody that's in need, and the Lord speaks to you to help, help. If you walk past somebody and you hear somebody is, is, is ill, and the Lord says to you, but pray for this person for healing, not just pray for, here a gila asjeblief krach. Anybody can pray that, that's an easy prayer. But pray for healing, then do it. Just do it, please, please, please. Be the angel. God, God wants you to do it. God wants you to be obedient. And God will use you in a mighty way. Let's just close our eyes and pray.